Good evening and welcome to session three of the St. Joseph of Arimathea Anglican Theological College course on the book of Genesis. I'm Mike Mountner, rector of St. Peter's Church in Oakland, California. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who hast caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A brief technical note about last week's broadcast. Uh, those of you who watched it live stream uh, recall we were silent for the first five minutes. Uh, those of you who are listening now but didn't see that broadcast, you really can't because the recording only has about 15 minutes of sound. Uh, we don't understand why that is. Uh, we're trying to work on that. Sound has been a problem with this platform from the beginning. Uh, but anyway, we're just going to carry on. Where we were at the end of last week's broadcast was about to dive into the text itself of Genesis, having finished most of the preliminaries. Uh, what we're dealing with this week in terms of the text, we're beginning to look at chapter 7 of the How to Read Genesis book by Tramper Longman. Got to get used to everything being the opposite uh, from the camera here. Sorry about that. How to read Genesis, Tramper Longman, chapter 7, The Primeval History. And uh, Longman divides, for his analytic purposes, the book of Genesis into three sections. The primeval history, the patriarchal narrative, and the Joseph uh, novella, uh, which is the last uh, part of the book of Genesis. Uh, as I described in the first lecture here, the way we're approaching this class is based on uh, the genealogies being the dividing points of the text, uh, the begats. And the first begat goes, or is the preface to the begats, goes up to chapter 2, verse 4, where the second account of creation is introduced, beginning the first of the begats, the Toledot, uh, which means you know, these are the generations of a lot of different translations uh, of that particular term. But the preface is Genesis 1-1 through Genesis 2-3. And let's take a look at exactly what is done in that text in order to decide what kind of text it is and what it says and then what it means. And remember, there are two principles in this course that are primary. One is that we all must discover first what the text says and before we are able to determine what it means, a meaning is often uh, something that is imposed on a text from without and either fits well or not so well. And in theology, uh, theology in the way it uses scriptural texts often uh, harmonizes different texts from different parts of the scriptures. We're going to take a much more isolated, microscopic kind of look here to the text and see exactly what it says. So Genesis 1.1 divides creation into six days, six days of creating. And let's make a little list here about what happens on those six days. And then I'm going to ask a question that may seem so obvious you didn't think of it, but you do need to think of it in order to understand what the text says rather than what you already think that it means. On the first day, light is created. That's what God says, let there be light and there was light. There was already apparently darkness of some kind or something that light changed, something that light transformed. And he divides on that first day the light from the darkness and therefore creates night and day. Appreciate for a moment that he creates night and day, but he doesn't create the things that we in the 21st century in the West 
think of as being the uh, generators, if you will, of night and day. Hold that thought till we get further down in the text. What does he do on the second day? In the second day, he creates a firmament, or some translations call it a vault. Uh, the image that's trying to be conveyed there is one of you're standing inside a dome. And that's the kind of vault it means. Uh, we experience this whenever we go uh, to a uh, planetarium, to a lazarium show or something, where something is projected onto a dome. That's the image of what God creates on the second day. And the firmament that he creates divides the waters. So there are already waters existing. Uh, that's what happens. There, there are waters there when God's spirit passes over them on the first day in the process of uh, creating and uh, making his statement about the light. So he divides the waters into the waters above the vault of the sky and the waters below the vault of the sky. So there is something that is not water, which is the firmament, the vault, the skies or the heavens, hamayim is the Hebrew, it's the word today just for the skies. And there is this division of the waters, therefore. And that's the second day. And that, of course, is the wonderful poetry of Genesis 1-1. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And then the third day begins. And what happens on the third day? The waters recede and the dry land appears. And God gives names to things. That's one of the uh, traits of God is the naming of things. And he calls the land that appears when the waters recede the earth. And he calls the gatherings together of the water the seas. Also on day three, and this is going to be important when we compare Genesis 1, 1, I mean Genesis 1 to Genesis 2. On the third day, the vegetation appears. All of the fruit-bearing trees and seed-bearing plants those all come in on the third day when the waters recede and the dry land appears. The dry land is not so dry, it's generating life. Life is coming out of it in the form of vegetation. And there was evening and there was morning, a third day. Notice the day begins in the evening. That is uh, the Near Eastern lunar calendar way of doing things ordinarily. The day begins at sundown. Uh, that's true also in the Chinese calendar, I'm told, uh, which is also a lunar calendar. Uh, that came up just on Chinese New Year here in the San Francisco Bay Area, big, uh, big event. Uh, and of course, the big thing happens in the evening. Now on day four, God does something to the firmament and creates something in the firmament. He creates the sun and the moon and the stars. Uh, the lesser light to rule the night, the greater light to rule the day. The day. He creates the sun and the moon on the fourth day. Well, in our understanding, the way we tend to understand our day uh, in the 21st century, it has a lot to do with the sun and the moon, right? Uh, the day is a function of the Earth's rotation. The Earth is rotating around its axis so that the light of the sun appears primarily on the side facing the sun as the Earth rotates. So day and night is an effect of the presence of the sun in proximity to the Earth, right? That's not the way the author of Genesis views the cosmos. And the fact that there are three days, or at least the use of that term, before the sun and the moon are created has consequences for us when we are interpreting the first three days of creation. 
by their own terms, by the terms of Genesis 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, the first three days of creation cannot possibly be 24-hour days because the 24-hour day is a function of the relationship of the sun and the moon to the rotating earth. And the sun and the moon don't exist until the fourth day. So you don't know how long those first three days of creation uh, in this account were. You can't know. Uh, the author of Genesis is not interested in that. He is the author of the text, uh, the human author of the text, through whom God is speaking his truths uh, by the Holy Spirit. Uh, that human author is not responding to our cosmological suppositions. Okay, so this is important in our framing uh, debates that we have about the place of the Bible in American society and what exactly it can mean for us today. Uh, as I said last week, which you probably can't hear now, the point of the first account of creation, Genesis 1-1 through Genesis 2-3, is light, Shabbos. I'm making a light, Shabbos. That's the range. That's the, how do weathermen do it? They're, that's the range. That's how things start with the light and they end with rest. And that's an important uh, transition. That's an important uh, array uh, of things happening in Genesis 1. So there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. And then on the fifth day, and notice that the text of Genesis 1 marks the passing of the day at its end. Okay, it always says after the text describes what happens on that day, then it says this was the third, fourth, fifth, whatever day. That's interesting also, perhaps in interpreting the meaning of the word day in this context. So day five, the waters begin to bring forth living creatures. And there are two kinds, the sea monsters and all the creatures of the sea, and those that come out of the waters and fly in the vault of the heavens, who fly in the firmament, the skies. And God does something for the first time on the fifth day to the creatures of the sea and the air. He blesses them. Uh, and he gives his blessing to them. So first the water brings forth life, that's the fifth day. Then on the sixth day, the earth will bring forth life. The cattle and the creeping things, and then us. <laughs> it's kind of interesting company to be kept in. The cattle and the creeping things. Uh, there's a famous rabbinic reflection uh, on the order of creation they ask in construing the first chapter of Genesis, why did God create mankind last? And the answer of the rabbis is, so that God can say to man when he is puffed up with pride, I made the net before thee. I've always liked that, and it's something we should remember too. So that is day six the cattle, the creeping things, and human beings, they are all made out of the ground, out of the earth. The earth brings it forth, brings forth life. The earth brings forth red clay. And God in Genesis 2 is going to be shown to be doing something, to be making, taking action with that clay in order to create humanity. And the words for Man and for the red clay are related. The red clay is Adama and man is Adam. And uh, I've seen in at least one translation this represented. It was probably the Robert Alter translation. Don't have it quite to hand. But the comparison of human and humus. You know, the humus is the most rich, most nutrient uh, full part of the soil, and it has a resonance, at least 
uh, in terms of sound with the word human. So Adam, Adama, human, humus. Interesting. But in Genesis 1, God is not a sculptor. He is not a creator. And let's take a look at the text specifically here because it's important, especially for the purpose of contrasting it with Genesis 2. Actually, on the sixth day, the sixth day, I'm sorry, is at the beginning of chapter 2. Uh, on the sixth day, God had finished his work which he had made. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm sorry. The evening and the morning, a sixth day. I'm experiencing some technical difficulties here. Please stand by. Ah, okay. It's up in Genesis 1, 26, is where he says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. This is after he has created all the beasts of the field and all the creeping things. Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and we're going to give him dominion over all these things that God, speaking in the uh, a plural, let us make man in our image. Uh, then he creates after he says that. The word of God always precedes the creative act. Verse 27, that's what I was looking for in the wrong place a moment ago. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him male and female. He created them. Then, as with the previous two creations of the sea creatures and uh the creatures of the land, he blesses them. With man, however, he gives them dominion. In Genesis 1, there has been no sculpting. He simply says, I'm going to do this, or we're going to do this. Let us do this. And it says us. The text does not explain what is meant by that. And we can take it in many different ways, each of which constitutes an interpretation as opposed to a mere reading of the text. Uh, there are many different ways of taking this. God could be speaking in the royal we, you know, as, as kings in much later time would say, because they represent all of creation, uh, or God represents all of creation in that kingly reading. He could also be talking to the animals. Let us make him in our image, okay, because... The animals have come up out of the ground, and man, at least in chapter 1, appears to be emerging also out of the earth. Let us make man in our image, and God is going to have impress his image on uh, man, but man also has uh, the image of the animal. Okay? God created us a little lower than the angels, Scripture says. It also means he created us a little higher than the apes. But we're still related. We're still close uh, to the animals in this. A digression before we get into uh, the seventh day in chapter 2, verse 3, and the end. Notice that when the only thing God does in chapter 1 is speak. It's the only specific thing he is said to do. Now, he divides, he separates also, but the text does not tell us how he does that. There is no anthropomorphic imagery in chapter 1, not particularly, other than speaking and addressing some other kinds of beings in terms of using uh, the third person and speaking in the plural so that is interesting, and hold that thought. We're going to compare that creation account to another one in the Near East. Uh, and in fact, let me, let me move to that before we get to the second account of creation. Uh, there are some other books that I have been 
using in the preparation of this class and talking uh, about. One of them is this wonderful book, Old Testament Parallels. And uh, this is in a new edition, actually, so it's, it's readily uh, available. Uh, it's always one of the texts at the St. Joseph of Arimathea Anglican Theological College, College Summer Session. Uh, so we always talk about that. It's a wonderful book in order to look at what was going on in other Near Eastern cultures in terms of their perception of the creation. There are two, the fir very first two texts in this book are called the Hymn to Ta'ah, it's P-T-A-H, and the Hymn to Atum, A-T-U-M, also sometimes spelled with an N, uh, also sometimes spelled with an O, Atum or Atum or Atum. Uh, these are two Egyptian religious texts. And the first one in the hymn to Ta, there's a wonderful contrast made between two different divine beings. And here's an important thing to remember. Belief and religious practice in the ancient world preceded text. Okay, people didn't learn about their gods from reading a text. They believed in their gods. They experienced their gods in their culture. And a literary strain or a literary community created texts about those gods. And one of the things that's fairly clear in these ancient Egyptian texts is that as the Egyptian empire emerged and grew and grew from city-states into the pharaonic empire that uh, covered eventually both upper and lower Egypt, the entire uh, White Nile uh, river basin, the gods of those individual places came all into the same pantheon. And we, we see this also in the history of myth in, in Greece and Rome. Uh, There's some anthropological data and uh, indication that uh, the gods had their own separate identities. And then as the territory expanded, uh, the gods all came to be in one pantheon. The writer of Genesis, both writers of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and the editor of both of them have put them together. Uh, more on that later. Uh, they are, in part, I think, probably responding to these texts. Now, you'll hear a lot on the Discovery Channel and the History Channel. Uh, they will often present this as some kind of proof that the biblical text is unreliable. Well, when they say that, they are knocking down a straw man uh, because they have created a, uh, a version of the faith that's easy to knock down. Uh, we understand what these texts are and that they have a history and that the imagery the authors use has a history. The author of our text, though, has a particular purpose. His purpose is ultimately moral. Uh, he is going to, or they are going to, or the redactor, the great editor who made the uh, Old Testament or the Torah into one book, uh, is going to uh, show uh, that God is active in human life, that he is one and united and cares, cares after the fashion of a loving father, uh, a strong and firm father but a loving father nonetheless. God creates in Genesis 1 and 2 in two different ways, though. I've just described, as we've gone through the first six days of creation in Genesis 1, how God does that. And, and listen to this, and I'm just going to read briefly from the introduction to the hymn to Ta in this wonderful book. It contrasts the divine patron of Memphis, which is Ta, and the divine patron of the town of Heliopolis, who was Atu. And listen to this. The people of Heliopolis will imagine Atu to be an artist who physically worked creation into existence. By contrast, the people of Memphis imagined Ta to be a judge 
who pondered and then simply called creation into existence. When you have a pantheon of gods, your religion tends to be one of blood and thunder and constant warfare because the gods are a dysfunctional family. They are always at war with one another one way or another uh, and their relations with humankind uh, are not necessarily friendly. Uh, pagan religion is all about appeasing the gods, keeping them at bay so they will leave man alone and will uh, allow humankind to just go its own way without interference. There is not a nurturing. But here you have two different views of divine creation in the hymn to Ta and the hymn to Atun, and you have a distant god who calls creation into being with his word, very much like Genesis chapter 1, and then you have an artist god who works with the materials of the earth in order to make humankind. In light of that, and skipping the Sabbath for a minute, hold that thought, we're going to come back to the Sabbath. It's probably the most important part of Genesis 1 and 2 as far as later Judaism is concerned, certainly, and it should matter to us, too, if for no other reason than that reason. The order of creation in Genesis 2 appears, at first blush, at least, to be a different order than the order in Genesis 1. Genesis 1 is very... Uh, logical and progressive and regimented, okay? This is what happened on day one, however long day one was. There was night and day, but there was no sun and moon, so we don't know what night and day meant, right? We don't. It's something very mysterious uh, from at least man's point of view. Uh, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, this is what happened in each of these intervals of time uh, day five and six, presumably being 24-hour days, because on the fourth day, the sun and moon were put in the firmament of the sky. When we get to Genesis 2, and again, it's not, well, here is the order. On the day before the vegetation was made, a spring gushes up, and then God creates man out of the earth. Okay, now in Genesis 1, vegetation came into being also out of the earth and sea on the third day. And then man came into being on the sixth day. Here you have God creating man out of the earth before the vegetation is created. It's hard to reconcile those two views uh, although one of the traditional ways of doing that in both Judaism and Christianity is seeing Genesis 2 as a commentary on Genesis 1, as filling in the meaning that we don't necessarily get from Genesis 1. I don't know if that works or not, but uh, those of you who are clergymen uh, and are watching this course for its intended purpose for the seminary, don't be frightened when your people notice this, it's there. And the worst thing that we can do is uh, attack uh, people who happen to notice that the text does not appear to reconcile, at least not at first blush. God creates man of the earth, Genesis 2. He plants a garden, God does, and he puts the man in the garden, and then... All the trees grow, all the vegetation grows, and then the four rivers flow out of Eden and make the boundaries, make the borders. And then God makes a command. He tells Adam, the man, humankind, not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or of the fruit of the tree of life. Okay, but the order, at least in the telling in Genesis 2, is different from the way it was in Genesis 1. 
we can view the relationship between these, these two chapters as specific and then just general. Uh, or we can say, as most modern scholars do, they come from two different sources. Uh, the first source being Genesis 1, a later text from what's called the priestly source, uh, which is hypothesized in part based on the style of writing, the way that it uh, is a very uh, good structured argumentative presentation. It's a very rational perspective. Uh, Genesis 2 is a more narrative perspective. A story is simply being told. There are not the poetic but also mathematical markers of day one, day two, day three, etc. The author just says, you know, before the vegetation came up, the water came up out of the ground, God made man, and he put him in a garden. And this is the account where God makes man by forming him out of the clay of the earth and breathing into him the breath of life. So in Genesis 1, we see a creator God who is a little bit more like the one in the Egyptian pantheon. And then the uh, Genesis 2 has a presentation of God as the artist, as the creator. And one of the things that the author or authors of these texts may be saying is, you guys need two gods to do this? <laughs> we have one, and he is the better of all of you. He can do things both ways. He can do things either way. He is both the judge who sits back and calls creation into being with his word, but he can also get in there and get his hands dirty, and he can do it both ways. And this, the way in Genesis 2, when God makes the command not to eat of the fruit of the tree and eat of the tree of good and evil and the tree of life, then God creates the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air. And Adam's job is to name them. And he names all of them, and then God decides that none of them are a fit help meet for him, a mate, a help that is meet for him in the wonderful translation of the King James, a help meet for him means a help, a helper who is adequate for him, who fits uh, and can work with him. Adam names all of them. There is no one meet for him. There is none who is his equal. And so God makes an equal out of him, out of Adam's rib. And what is created out of Adam's rib in Genesis 2? Woman, who remains merely the woman in the text until toward the end of Genesis chapter 2, uh, where Adam names his wife, uh, calls her Eve, or in the Hebrew, in some of the Hebrew, it's Chava. Uh, it's interesting that Eve is not actually named in, uh, I'm sorry, he, she's named at the end of chapter 3. This is important as we move on into the first Toledot. Uh, it's only at the end of, it's in Genesis 3, verse 20, that the wife is actually named. So for the first part of all of this, she is just the woman, which is interesting uh, on two different levels and for two different reasons. What are those two different reasons? In Genesis 1-1, sorry, in Genesis 1, excuse me a minute, I'm running out of steam. In Genesis 1, the creation of humankind appears to be neutral, gender neutral. God creates in one act, creating male and female at the same time. God created humanity, male and female, created he then. He makes one creation that is both male and female. 
Uh, in Genesis 2, the story is could be different or could be filling in the details of Genesis 1. Uh, Genesis 1 does not say, remember how God does anything other than by his word, which is one of the traditional ways of reconciling these two texts. Uh, Genesis 1 gives us an outline. Genesis 2 gives us the details. That's one way of looking at this. Uh, Genesis 1 is clear, though, that God creates male and female, and that the creation of them is one thing. Uh, so you know, theologies that try to subordinate women on the basis merely of the order of creation are misreading the text. They're not appreciating the meaning of God's single act of creation uh, in Genesis 1, and they're overemphasizing the Adam's rib thing. The point of that is the closeness between the two. Adam says, this is flesh of my flesh, this is bone of my bone. She will be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Uh, they are part of each other. You know, we are two halves of the same whole. Uh, and that's the real message, particularly of looking at those two accounts of the creation of man and woman uh, side by side, looking at them side by side. Now, what about Shabbos? What about the Sabbath? What about Sabbath rest? In the text... It's the very end of the preface. And remember, we spoke in the last two sessions about the Toledot, the, gener the generations, the different uh, genealogies. The first of those is Genesis 2.4, which simply says, these are the generations of the heaven, heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Isn't that interesting? It was he did it all in one day. <laughs> he can do it in six. He can do it in one. He can do it. It's, the point is that he can do it. And uh, the text is not all that interested in... Uh, remember, this is a kind of literature, not a kind of law. And Judaism makes the uh, distinction between halakha, the way... Uh, the things that point us in the way that we're supposed to walk, and agada, the stories, the things that teach us and tell us uh, how to be through literature, through a literary approach to things. How long was a day? Before the sun and the moon were created? Who knows? And did God make everything in a day or the day? Uh, if you think about it, Interestingly enough, there's a new phrase that's come into uh, come into common parlance in the last 10 years or so, at least in my experience, where people say, back in the day, uh, there's an example of the use in English of the word day in an extremely general way. Uh, back in the day is usually, uh, it's a replacement, I think, for the phrase that we used to hear, back in the old days. That was a plural. The new one is a singular. Uh, neither one is meant to have legal specificity. Uh, and I think the same is true of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. They are focused on the point. The point, the end point of the preface. Uh, Genesis 2-3, so God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because in it he had rested from all his works which God created and made. He blessed the seventh day. He hallowed it. He himself rested from all the work of creation that he had been doing. What does that mean? What does it mean that God rested? Well, we don't know. The text does not tell us what it means. It means, obviously, on the literary, literal level, that he didn't do any more work of creating. He didn't make anything else on that seventh day except the Sabbath. And he made the Sabbath by one himself resting, ceasing to create for a period of time. He blessed it and he hallowed it. 
He hallowed that without any reference to mankind, at least in the first telling of it. Later on in the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath will be prominent among them. The Sabbath will become very important in the formation of Israel as a nation through the law and through the, the giving of the law during the Exodus experience. But the first we see of it in Scripture, it's something that involves God alone. And he doesn't tell Adam and Eve, who haven't been named yet in Genesis 1, they get their names later, uh, but he doesn't tell the humans, he doesn't tell the animals that he was uh, you know, he had created. He doesn't tell anybody. God just rests. And we don't know what that means. We know what it doesn't mean. Uh, we know that uh, we know what God does not do on that day. Uh, we don't know what he does. Uh, can God be said to have ceased? There are very profound theological questions here. But the text says he stopped working. He rested. Uh, and what that means from a Trinitarian standpoint uh, is very difficult, I think, to figure out based on the text. It could mean all kinds of things. But the point that the text makes is God created, he brought light, and he ended with his Sabbath. And those are the most important features of the first chapter. And then the editor puts the two together, uh, juxtaposes this second account of creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. And this tornado will go all the way to the beginning of chapter 5. Uh, this is the book, chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God created he him. Male and female he created them, and God blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. That's Genesis 5.1, recapping and then moving on into the first big genealogy uh, that introduces the second section of Genesis. So the first section ends at Genesis 2.4 and Chapter 3, uh, mankind is created, woman is created, and there is a moral to the creation story in chapter 2. Uh, and that moral is, what is the consequence of God having created woman out of man? And after Adam says, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, the author interjects, really for the first time, a statement about life now. Life now the time of writing, life now the time of redacting, of editing the text. Verse 24 of chapter 2. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This author has told of something in the past, and then he has brought it into his reader's present, saying, this is a reason for something that is now. The same may be true of the Sabbath. The Sabbath may have been a reality for the author, something that existed, and he is telling its secret origin. Origins are an important part of the book of Genesis. One of the things we will note along the way is that as stories are told, landmarks are created, and the author will describe a landmark, and he will say, and it is there to this day. Uh, the most vivid of those is Lot's wife being turned into a pillar of salt, you know, and you can see it. Uh, it is still there today. It's a very, Genesis is a very place-centric text. It is a text from a particular place, and the author presumes that his reader is familiar with that geography. Okay, that's something that, since we are not familiar with that geography, certainly not in the intimate way that the writer is, uh, we don't have, uh, that's a disadvantage that we have uh, in looking at the text. 
But we do still marry, even in California, those of you who are uh, out of the state, uh, and we do, a man does leave his mother and father and he and his wife become one flesh. That's an interesting aside, almost, from the narrator, who then immediately returns to his current narrative in verse 25. And they were both naked, Adam and his wife, and were not ashamed. So clearly the writer knows that you know, he and his readers understand that when you are naked, you are ashamed, you are doing something wrong and have to stop. And that is the introduction to the uh, story of what Christians call the fall in chapter 3. And we're going to pick that up in the next class. Uh, the next class will be about Genesis 3 and 4, which is the last half of the first Toledot, the first generation. Uh, the focus of the second Toledot is on Noah uh, and the story of the flood. Uh, and then uh, the final one is in the what, what uh, Longman calls uh, the primeval history uh, that ends with the Tower of Babel. And again, uh, chapter 7 of Longman is what to take a look at. And we're going to stop going through the text directly here to talk about something I covered in some depth last week, uh, which, of course, those of you who weren't live streaming can't watch it because there's some problem with uh, the technology here. I need water. It's important to the technology of my machinery here. Uh, for those of you who are able to locate it, here's a, a wonderful little book by Yaroslav Pelikan. Uh, it's called On Searching the Scriptures, Your Own or Someone Else's. And it has two very brief chapters about the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, the Apocrypha, and the New Testament, uh, which are two separate volumes of the series uh, called uh, the Sacred Writings that Dr. Pelican edited. Uh, Dr. Pelican was a Roman Catholic, a believer, and a great scholar. Uh, we lost him a few years ago. He wrote some amazing books, some of which are uh, for popular consumption, and one of those is called Whose Bible Is It? And it is actually a history of the text of Scripture in both the Jewish community and the Christian community and the parallel development of views of the Scriptures. This book is its very, very short. The part about the Tanakh and about the Apocrypha and New Testament, uh, those two chapters together are only about 12 pages. So this is great if you can find it. Uh, there's no problem finding whose Bible is it. Uh, that was a popular book and uh, had a lot of printings, and there's a lot of copies out there uh, on Amazon and elsewhere. That's a great book to get a full feel for the depth of the question of authority, uh, of what is the text, where does it come from, and uh, how can we rely on it. And the one thing I... <laughs> didn't have with me last week, which I should have, was the Articles of Religion in the Book of Common Prayer on this question. If you look at the back of the Book of Common Prayer, Article 60, page 603, Article 6, this is a proclamation of theology about the Holy Scriptures. All right now, in the American church, the Articles of Religion have never had kind of authority they had in England, that's impossible because we don't have an established church. Thanks be to God. The Church of England uh, gets its marching orders from the king and parliament, those two together. And the Articles of Religion, the 39 Articles, were statutory law. And to be a clergyman of the Church of England, you had to I believe you still do. Uh, they may be changing that. The last time I looked, and I don't follow too much of the, the news and these things anymore. It's too depressing. Uh, they had to 
and swear allegiance to the monarch and to the articles of religion. Say, this is what we believe, because this is as close as a statement, as close to a statement of faith as Anglicanism gets. Uh, really, as Anglo-Catholics, our statement of faith is the creeds, the Nicene and uh, Apostles' Creed. Uh, those don't address, of course, all the issues uh, that people look for in a statement of faith, but of course they've also stayed the same for 1,500, or I'm sorry, almost 1,700 years. Uh, the Nicene Creed has been largely the same. Uh, the Southern Baptist Convention changes its uh, statement of belief every five years, so we have a little bit more uh, stability of a certain kind uh, in Anglicanism. Let's take a look at Article 6 of the Articles of Religion. It's titled, Of the Sufficiency of the Holy Scriptures for Salvation. Holy Scripture containeth all things necessary to salvation, so that whatsoever is not read therein, nor may be proved thereby, is not to be required of any man that it should be believed as an article of the faith, or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation. And then... The writer is sensitive to definition. In the name of the Holy Scripture, we do understand those canonical books of the Old and New Testaments of whose authority was never any doubt in the church. And he gives a list of the canonical books of the Old Testament, which inter in interestingly include the first book of Esdras and the second book of Esdras, which the King James uh, Committee later uh, will put in the Apocrypha. Interestingly, there's nothing in the Articles of Religion about the question of translation. Uh, that was something that was going to be handled separately. That's why King James called uh, the conference together that decided to do the translation uh, of the Holy Scriptures that resulted in our King, what we call the King James Version. Uh, it doesn't take a position on that, though, because that wasn't yet uh, an issue. There was only, there were one or two English translations circulating at this time. One was Roman Catholic. Uh, one was uh, Mr. Coverdale. Uh, there were a couple of things out there. None of them had been blessed by the church. In fact, they were all sort of dissident texts, if you will. The Church of England clergy in the 16th century was against the vernacular. For the most part, they wanted to keep things in Latin. Uh, that was the language of learning. That was the language of scholarship. Uh, and if we want to be cynical about them, we can say it was also uh, the language that only they spoke, so uh, or only they could read. So there's, there's that aspect to it also. Uh, if we were to write our own articles of religion, God forbid... I'm not going to do that. That only causes dissension and argument and needless wrangling. Uh, but one of the things we might do is articulate uh, the question of the authority of a particular translation of Scripture. Uh, the next article of the Articles of Religion, Article 7, is interesting for us, and it is clearly directed at a controversy uh, a controversy that continued for centuries after that, I think, as I identify it with some other trends in, in modern European religious history. It's about the Old Testament, and it is a statement in favor of the Old Testament. Okay? The Old Testament is not contrary to the New. For both in the Old and New Testament, everlasting life is offered to mankind by Christ who is the only mediator between God and man, being both God and man. Wherefore, they are not to be heard, as people were making this argument at the time, they are not to be heard, which feign that the old fathers did look only for transitory promises. Although the law given from God by Moses as touching ceremonies and rites do not bind Christian men, or the civil precepts thereof ought of necessity to be received in any commonwealth, yet notwithstanding no Christian man whatsoever is free from the obedience of the commandments which are called moral. Uh, clearly there was a, an attempt 
to jettison the Old Testament, or at least to uh, put its authority aside. Uh, and if you take the authority of the Old Testament away from the Christian church or out of the Christian church, uh, and people as late as the 1890s and the turn of the 20th century said that they should do that, uh, it's particularly in Germany, among uh, the scholars of religion who gave us uh, modern critical scholarship, uh, they also concluded, you know, the Old Testament is this horrible, violent, uh, wicked book that Christians should no longer have anything to do with. Uh, we can't take that view. I think I said in the first class that uh, one of the consequences of that in Germany was, you know, well, you uh, have uh, jettisoned or at least denigrated uh, the book. Uh, the people of the book can't be far behind. And those trends in late 19th century Germany were not unrelated. This was the era of the rise of anti-Semitism and, frankly, higher criticism, uh, I view, in that light. It comes up at the same time, and those two views are often shared by the same people. Uh, and you know, even in the 20th century, uh, Rudolf Bultmann uh, kept teaching at the university uh, in Germany all throughout the war. Uh, all around him uh, in the late 30s, uh, fellow professors were... <laughs> Uh, disappearing or being banished uh, from the profession because of their Jewish background. Uh, it didn't seem to bother him. He was developing a, a theology of Christ, sort of uh, separated from history and, frankly, ultimately separated from real life. Uh, the Old Testament is the book of real life. Uh, in terms of the first chapters that we've just read, uh, the real life part is the character of God in doing what those two chapters say he is doing. He is both logical, reasonable, creative, energetic, and good. One of the most important things he says is, it is good. He pronounces the creation good. A very important point to remember. The world, the creation, is a good thing. So when we get into chapter 3 next week and read about what we in the church call the fall of man, a phrase you will not actually see in the scriptures themselves, but when we get into that, remember that what is falling is, is something that is good. And the author of the book of Genesis uh, does not perceive the fall in quite the same way that we do uh, in the Christian church in later uh, times. We view it through the lens of our later theology and also of the unfolding revelation of God in Jesus Christ throughout the rest of the Old Testament and into the New. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up his countenance before us and give us all the blessings of his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.